Welcome to another Thought Hockey. It's the start of a new season with training camps open and exhibition games already underway. It's the perfect time to look back on the offseason and see what teams were up to these past couple months. Now, it'd be too easy to just look back and say, oh, this team did this right. This team did that great. Mm, I think what I'm going to do is look back at maybe what some teams did wrong. What were the moves that may come back to haunt a team? The player they traded away, the player they traded for, or the new fresh face that they've just signed to a big contract. Let's start with the Central Division. The Arizona Coyotes. Wow, just wow. When you take a look at what they did, they moved off of Oliver ekman Larson and they rid themselves of most of their long-term commitments while bringing in decent players on expiring contracts who they'll probably even look to move at the deadline for even more picks. They were able to get a lot uh, in taking on Andrew Ladd's contract. They were able to get something for taking on Shane Gostas Bears. So it's really hard to say that they did anything wrong. It looks like they're probably in for a pretty tough season. So maybe we'll just say overall roster building. But again, I think that's really all part of the plan moving forward. The Chicago Blackhawks, um, I mean, actually, they probably had one of the better off seasons in terms of player movement. Now, the one big thing that they seem to have really dropped the ball on is handling all the off ice turmoil that's been going on. I'm not going to get into that really or give my own opinion. I would say, though, if you are looking for as much information in a digestible form that you can get, uh, the Steve Dangle podcast had Rick Westhead. He's been the guy who's kind of really been following along this uh, as much as you can go. And I'd say uh, check out that episode. It's from about a month ago. Taking a look at the Colorado Avalanche. Well, they managed to keep Gabriel Landeskog and they got him on a pretty decent deal. I don't really know that they did much wrong. They probably would have liked to have held on to Philip Grubauer. So we could probably say that's probably the biggest thing for this year. Um, they were able to bring in Darcy Kemper though. So hopefully for them, at least, uh, that's going to shore up the goaltending. Uh, beyond that, I didn't really see anything glaring. So like Chicago, we're going to give Colorado a little bit of a pass on this one, but losing Grubauer uh, definitely wasn't uh, part of the plan. Well, you know, maybe I shouldn't have started with the Central Division. It seems like at least a few teams here really didn't do much wrong. Um, I know with Dallas, they didn't make a ton of moves to begin with. I don't know that $3 million for Ryan Suter is a great contract, but if you want the player, and certainly he does produce at a high level, he is still a good player. Uh, in spite of being bought out by the Minnesota Wild in the offseason. So I can't really argue with that too much. So again, maybe we'll just give uh, maybe we'll just give Dallas a pass on this one. The Minnesota Wild. Well, I can't say it was easy for them to make this move, but I gotta think making that Kirill Kaprizov contract for what it's worth, I I just it might be too much too soon for for a, that type of a player. I know they were up against it. He floated the idea of playing in Russia, and I know there was a team there who was certainly willing to commit a lot of money to him. So I think their back was up against the wall a little bit on this one. So, But I'm still going to throw that in as probably their worst move of the season. With the Nashville Predators, there weren't too many moves to choose from in terms of something that was glaring. I think what may end up being the worst move that they made was in not keeping Nolan Patrick uh, as part of that big three-way deal. I I think moving forward, he may end up being the player that everybody was hoping he would be when he was drafted so high by the Flyers. But they were able to get a good young player back for him from the Knights and up the middle, in spite of them being on not great contracts. Nashville does have two decent centers in Duchesne and Johansson, so maybe it wouldn't really play out anyway. Maybe there isn't a great spot for him but that's what I'll go with. Looking at the St. Louis Blues, I think I'm probably a little disappointed that they didn't get a chance to move Vladimir Tarasenko. I don't know if they thought it was realistic for Seattle to take him in the expansion draft because he was exposed, but still it, it really seemed like everything was coming to a head with him and that he would be moved and they haven't done it. Also the Brandon Saad contract, even though I do like the player, might be a little bit too much money and a few too many years. So. We'll have to see how that one plays out. Last up in the central is the Winnipeg Jets. Overall, 
not a ton of bad moves. I, I think the one thing they probably should have done in the offseason that it doesn't seem like they were able to was to find a good backup goalie. They have one of the best goalies in the league in Connor Hellebuck, but let's make sure we can give the guy a rest and put a good goalie in there who's got a good chance to give your team some points while your number one's on the bench. Kicking off the Pacific Division is the Anaheim Ducks, a team that really didn't do much in the offseason, certainly nothing that I was going to get really too excited about. I don't know that bringing back Ryan Getzlaff is a bad move. I think his contract is $3 million. It's uh, it's not a not a big deal, and it's definitely movable at the trade deadline too. So if that's kind of their goal, their aim, he certainly wasn't an easy guy to move last year because of his high cap hit. So we'll see if this year allows him to do that. I don't really think they've got much else that really stuck out to me. Looking at the Calgary Flames, the one that I don't like most of all is the Blake Como contract. And I'll probably get some pushback for that. You can let me know in the comments section. I just don't know whether or not Blake Coleman should be a $5 million a year player, $4.9 million a year player, whatever. But six years at 4.9 just seems like a whole lot. Now, I know you have to overpay a little bit in free agency, but let someone else overpay in free agency. It doesn't necessarily have to be your team. In the cap world that we're living in, you can't make a mistake on a $5 million player. So if Coleman continues on the track and he has scored 20 goals a few times in the past, that's great for the Flames. Hopefully it all works out, but something tells me on this team, not in that Tampa Bay situation he's been in for the past little while, he's going to look like a totally different player. The other move the Flames made that I don't really agree with was bringing in Eric Goodbranson. Not that I don't like the player. He's a giant and he likes to punch people in the face when they touch one of his teammates. But once you get past that, he really doesn't bring a lot to the team. Uh, you look at the analytics community and they're gobsmacked by the way that this deal went down, giving him probably double what he should have made on the open market. Yeah, I said gobsmacked, deal with it. Here we go, it's the Edmonton Oilers and I'm not really sure why they did most of what they did this off season. For one, they didn't address the goaltending. Now I know Mike Smith actually had a pretty decent year last year, but I don't know that bringing him back and keeping Koskinen was really the right move. There were a ton of goalies available in the offseason. All of them, you could argue, would be better than both of the goalies currently on the Oilers. I do understand getting Hyman, a great player, extremely versatile, plays in most situations. It's just a lot of money for a player who, other than the fact he can play with good players, is probably more of a third line player who plays up than of actual first line player who's gonna get you what you need. I would imagine the the plan is to have him play with McDavid. And I don't know that his skill set suits McDavid's as well as it did with Matthews and Marner in Toronto. The other contract they handed out that I didn't like was Ryan Nugent Hopkins. I think it's a lot for that player. And I think it's too many years too. Now, again, he's been an oiler for life and they wanna keep him on the team. And he sure seemed like he wanted to stay there. I just don't get the cap hit and I don't get the duration. If you want to keep him for that many years, let him take a little bit of a haircut on the deal. I just, I don't see that deal working out for them past the third, maybe even the fourth season. And then you're going to have dead cap space. You're either going to buy out or have to move and lose something in the process. And for Ryan Nugent Hopkins and what he brings to the team, I really don't know that that's enough for me to risk those last four years on that deal. Now, the biggie was the Duncan Keith trade. That was one I understood from the standpoint of bringing in a veteran who's obviously got a great pedigree and can be a big leader for this team and really set an example. But the fact that his play has diminished so much after the past couple of seasons, and no fault of Duncan, he's getting older, he's had injuries and other things throughout his career, and we're getting closer to the end. My biggest problem with this trade was you didn't get Chicago to take on any of the salary before you got him. And you gave up a player in Caleb Jones that helped Chicago become a very attractive landing spot to Seth Jones. You almost sealed that deal for them, ensuring that he would go to a team in your conference. All along the way, I think there was even a pick involved too. And that to me, it's just way too much for that player who, again, 
is really on the downturn of his career, almost to the level of being a replacement level player. Next up is the LA Kings, a team that made uh, a lot of moves that I actually agreed with. You might say that the Dano contract uh, may be a little bit too much and a little bit too long for that player. But again, like I've mentioned for a few of these contracts I don't agree with, in unrestricted free agency, sometimes you do have to overpay and you do have to give that extra year if you want to get the player. So maybe that's just what they did here. And again, I don't particularly disagree with the deal. Uh, I think it's actually a smart move to bring in that type of player. And we'll see. Hopefully the dollars and the time frame of the deal work out for them. Looking at the San Jose Sharks, that's a team that, again, didn't really do a whole lot this offseason. Certainly nothing that I would disagree with from an on-ice standpoint. The Evander Kane saga, however, has gotten a little bit out of control and I'm sure is a bit embarrassing for them. And maybe that's what I'll say is their most disappointing is something that took place off ice. I don't know what they can really do about Evander Kane, but I do wonder at some level, could they have caught this a little earlier? Were there signs that they could recognize? Could they have helped this player in a way before it got to this level? Maybe they could, and, and maybe they couldn't have. Uh, addictions like this are very tricky to handle, and and sometimes it's out of the team's control what the player does. So, but even still, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw that out there as the thing that they did wrong uh, this off season. Seattle Kraken, you guys get a pass. Next up is the Vancouver Canucks, who you could argue two best players aren't even on their team right now because Vancouver hasn't signed them to contracts yet. Elias Pedersen and Quinn Hughes are both on the sidelines skating, I believe, somewhere in Michigan, uh, not with their team. And uh, that's mind boggling to me. I'd say those guys should have been dealt with really early on. Instead, Vancouver decided to re-sign players like Jason Dickinson and Travis Hamannick. And Hamannick, wow, for a guy you signed to a one-year deal for one million last season, to give him two years at three million, when you have like the number one defenseman on your team still floating in the wind, I can't imagine why you would give that amount of money to a player who is basically a league minimum player at this stage of his career. The Canucks really only have $13 million to spend on two players who are probably worth about $16 million. That's my biggest problem with the signings they made. It's the same old Vancouver Canucks. Let's bring in a couple of guys who are pretty decent on other teams and we'll just hope they turn into stars for our team on mid-dollar deals with term. It hasn't worked in the past. You were lucky enough to rid yourself of a couple of contracts to bring in Oliver ekman Larson, who again, at a high ticket, may interfere with your ability to adequately sign your younger players. Vancouver, stop doing this. Are you a team that's good? No, not really. Are you going anywhere? Yeah, probably. You've got some good young players. Well, stop bringing in these mid-level guys who keep getting in the way of future contracts and your team, I guess, sucking enough that you'll get some decent draft picks to go with the guys that are already there. The Vegas Golden Knights, who didn't make a ton of changes in the offseason, so I'm going to go with the handling of the Marc-Andre Fleury trade to the Chicago Blackhawks. I did bring this up already in a previous video of mine where I basically said I didn't think it was as big of a deal as what everybody was making it out to be. But I will still say that is the worst thing they did this summer. The way it was handled seemed a little bit sloppy. And for the guy who was the first face of the franchise, yeah, I think it's right that people expect a little bit more. Jumping across to the Eastern Conference, we're going to take a look at the Metropolitan Division, starting with the Carolina Hurricanes. Carolina Hurricanes gave up on goalie Alex Nedeljkovic. He's now in Detroit, and he was traded for a third-round pick and the signing rights to a player that Carolina didn't re-sign. I really don't know what was going on there with them. It seems like they do weird things with goaltending, and maybe this is just the next step in that direction. Um, I don't know whether or not they figured they were even going to really be able to sign Nadalkovich or not. And maybe that's the real reason why they traded him. So who knows? It could end up being a good move anyway. But it just seemed like they had a guy who was ready to be a number one. And they sort of got rid of him and decided to pay Frederick Anderson even more than he got from Detroit. 
The other questionable move they made was the Kakanyemi signing. I did another video about this previously. Uh, again, go back and watch it if you like. Uh, I thought it was a stellar work on my part. Uh, but that deal, uh, $6 million deal for a player who hasn't really accomplished $6 million worth of play yet in his short NHL career, just doesn't make sense to most people. Now again, probably something going to happen after the midpoint of the season or in, into January into 2022 where he can officially sign an extension and maybe they already have something worked out where you blend in this year's with say a three or a four year deal moving forward and then the money kind of works out to make itself you know a little more palatable overall even that being said I didn't really see the reason to do that with the player uh, it's a little backlash for the Montreal thing with Aho. Who knows? Uh, maybe Tom Dundon just wanted to kind of stick to them. And Don Waddell found a player he liked on their roster to do it to. The Columbus Blue Jackets. Um, really, most of what they did was rebuild moves. And when you're in rebuild mode, you're allowed to get wacky. So I'm not really going to criticize them all that much for what they did. I think generally they're just looking to set themselves up to be good in a couple of years. The New Jersey Devils. Hey guys, I know what you're thinking. Um, why is Dana just criticizing every big free agent signing this year? Okay, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, but I am gonna throw out the Dougie Hamilton seven year, $9 million deal that the Devils gave out to the former Hurricane Flame and Bruin and sort of Maple Leaf. Like I've said a few times in this video already, you do have to overpay to get the guy if you really want him. And that's what New Jersey did here. Uh, they now have two right-handed defensemen, power play offensive specialists who make $9 million a year in Hamilton and PK Subban. Now the Subban contract expires this year. So I expect this to be a little bit of insurance and Subban could probably be moved at any time to another team to bring in the type of player who maybe fills in the gaps that Hamilton lacks in his game in spite of him being a big time point producer. I just don't like the number of years. I just don't like the number of dollars. It could end up coming back to haunt them when some of the good young players on New Jersey need new contracts of their own. The New York Islanders. When your team has Lou Lamarillo as a general manager, it really is difficult to pick out things that you don't like because Lou's usually pretty shrewd and, and he makes smart decisions and tends to not overpay or overextend. Uh, I was a little surprised when he made Jordan Eberle and Josh Bailey available to Seattle in the draft. Eberle was the guy they lost and that may come back to hurt them as much as they wanted to keep a hold of guys like Cal Clutterbuck and Matt Martin without losing them in the expansion draft. I think replacing a guy like Eberle may be a lot more difficult and who knows what happens to the first two lines, let's say, where he would have fit in again this year and, and how that affects the team. The other move you could look at is maybe the Ladd trade. Uh, they traded Ladd with a whole bunch of draft picks to the Coyotes. They got nothing back other than the cap space uh, relief, at least in the summer before he goes on LTIR. You can only go 10% above the cap during the summer. And in order to sign Anthony Beauvillier and Matt Pellick, you needed that space to do that. Those are two players you definitely didn't want to leave hanging uh, without contracts. They also brought in a couple of guys along the way, re-signed Casey Zizekas, brought in Zach Parise. So that really just gave them flexibility and it also took him off their books. So maybe at the end of the day, in spite of having to give up a lot to get rid of Ladd, um, maybe it's not the worst thing in the world that they did. For the New York Rangers, they really didn't make a ton of moves. They did sign Barkley Goodrow, um, who should never be confused with Barkley Greatrow. Uh, he is just good, and there's nothing wrong with that. He got $3.6 million on a multi-multi-year deal, and I'm not convinced he's really going to be worth that. Again, not as much as Coleman got in Calgary, but I'll be equally as critical because Goodrow doesn't really have the same production that Coleman had with the Lightning. I think it's just as likely that he doesn't live up to this cap hit at this duration, but again, the cap hit being so much smaller it's almost hard to be mad at. Looking at the Philadelphia Flyers, I think my biggest criticism for them overall is that they just had so much movement. 
And I'm not talking a few minor players and picks here. I'm talking big pieces on their team. They moved out Jacob Voracek. They moved out of Shane Gostisbehere. And they also gave up Nolan Patrick, who was a top pick from a couple of years ago. I think we may look back on that trade and we may wonder why Philadelphia was so willing to give him up. Let's take a look at the Pittsburgh Penguins. Not a ton of moves, so maybe it's difficult to find something to criticize. They did sign John Marino to a lengthy extension at $4.4 million a season. Uh, this is a younger player who's hopefully coming into his own for the Penguins. I guess that's why they extended him so long. He's a right shot D, and with Chris Letang's contract up at the end of this season, maybe they're hoping he'll step in and fill that role if Letang decides to go elsewhere. The Washington Capitals. I don't really think they made any bad moves. Uh, maybe some people think Alexander Ovechkin is making too much money for too long at his age, but realistically speaking, it's Alexander Ovechkin. How can you go wrong with this guy? He's meant everything to the franchise. And uh, he's certainly going to pay that in dividends as he gets closer to the Gretzky record. There's going to be a lot of eyeballs on that team, a lot of attention, a lot of revenue generation, a lot of jerseys, a lot of sticks, all those things. Uh, that people are going to want to pick up to commemorate the closing years of his career and see if he actually does catch Wayne. I think that'll be an interesting story moving forward. Now for the Atlantic division. And first up is the Boston Bruins. I really question whether or not Linus Allmark is going to be the starting goalie that the Boston Bruins need. And if he's not, I'm also questioning whether or not Jeremy Swayman is the backup that Lanus Allmark needs in case he falters. Losing to Rask obviously was a little bit of out of the Bruins control, uh, but I don't know if they did enough to keep Yaroslav Halak, a goalie who you can probably pencil in for 30 good games in the NHL. Now you're going with a somewhat unproven starter, albeit a goalie who put up decent numbers with the Sabres and a rookie. I'm also going to scratch my head a little bit at the Taylor Hall signing. I know he's a great player. They're giving him a lot of money and they're giving him a bunch of years. And again, he did play well for them. So as long as he keeps that up, I, I think they're good. The other one, of course, as well is Nick Foligno. And I thought Foligno was going to be maybe a $2 million player moving forward. I thought he'd only be going back to Columbus or maybe to Minnesota to play with his brother. And I maybe held out a little bit of hope he might stay with the Leafs. He certainly seemed excited to be there uh, when that trade was made. But at um, close to four million, I don't know whether he's got enough left in the tank to give that those dollars couldn't have been spent better elsewhere. The Buffalo Sabres, they're a bad hockey team. Now they're in full, complete rebuild scramble mode and they're trying to move Jack Eichel or are they? I don't really know. It sort of seems like they're going to just hang on to him for another season and not do anything. I don't think that'll improve his value. I'm not really sure what they're up to, but that's the biggest disappointment of the season. That and the fact that Craig Anderson looks like they're starting goalie this year. The Detroit Red Wings, uh, they made one somewhat puzzling move uh, to me this offseason. That was trading for Nick Letty. I know the Islanders were trying to shed salary and get rid of a few veterans that they basically just didn't want around anymore because they had more players to re-sign. They actually gave up quite a lot to do that. But when they made the trade uh, to Detroit, they got back a player in Richard Ponick with retained salary. And they also got a pick and Detroit picked up a $5 million player in Letty, who's basically near the end of his career. Now they don't have cap issues. They have a low cap team because they're young and most of their players don't earn a ton. So the cap hit isn't really that big of a deal, but the fact that they had to actually give up something to get that player was a little puzzling to me. With the Florida Panthers, they signed three big contract extensions for this season to Sam Bennett, Sam Reinhart, and Anthony Duclair. They also signed a contract extension for Carter Verhage that will kick in in the 2022-23 season. That contract is going to pay him a little more than four, uh, $4.1 million a year next season and the two seasons after that. I don't necessarily have a problem with that contract for that player, although 
I think he probably could slide back into a depth role replacement level player at some point. Uh, he may not maintain the last couple seasons he had uh, where he did put up some decent numbers. The only thing that really worries me is they're adding that contract to a team that doesn't have a ton of money coming off the books next year, but has to add a big contract for Sasha Barkov. That is definitely a guy you do not want to lose because you sign a mid-talent player to a $4 million a year contract. Next up, the Montreal Canadiens, who I don't think have overall had a bad offseason. They had the offer sheet and allowed Jasperi Kakanyemi to walk, but they did pick up a first and a third. They were able to turn that first and a second round pick into Christian Dvorak, who's the type of player that they need uh, after losing Dano to the Kings in free agency. They were able to pick up uh, a couple other players to fill some spots. So I don't think overall their trades and signings were all that bad. I think if they're going to have difficulties this year, it'll probably be mostly due to not having Shea Weber and whether or not Carey Price is going to come to 100% uh, for the start of the regular season. And if not, how long is it going to take him and where does that leave him? They've got Jack, Jake Allen as the backup. Uh, I think they'll probably be fine that way either way. But again, I think they actually made a lot of good moves. The one thing I really didn't agree with this year was drafting Logan Mayu in the first round of the entry draft. This is a player who asked teams not to draft him at all. He's had some legal trouble. I probably don't need to get into it. Most of you already know. Go ahead and look it up when this video is over and you can see for yourself. I guess at some point, some team was gonna draft him. And I guess the Montreal Canadiens decided it was gonna be them. They almost immediately released a statement regarding this pick, almost as though they knew they were going to pick him and they already had something prepared to throw out to the media to try to, I guess, appease or reason with the fans. Uh, it kind of rang a little hollow to me when I read it and I heard Mark Bergevin talk about some of the stuff to do with it. Uh, but that's their real big misfire this offseason. With the Ottawa Senators, you're looking at a team that's basically still rebuilding. They're a team with a bunch of good young players who are all going to get a little bit better from last year to this year. So I don't think there's really much to criticize. I will say not having Brady Kachuk uh, ready with a contract in hand for the start of training camp is a big disappointment. That's a player you're trying to build around. You drafted him early. You took a risk. It paid off. He's a great young player get this guy signed. Uh, what is it that you're doing with him? And figure this one out, guys, because you cannot afford, if you're hoping to develop your team moving forward, that, that this player is not going to be on your opening night roster. The Stanley Cup champion, Tampa Bay Lightning. It's somewhat hard to criticize them. They won the last two cups. They probably should get a free pass from me, but I'm going to go back to the expansion draft here to the start of what I would consider their worst move. Protecting four and four, keeping Ryan McDonough protected, to me, wasn't that wise of a move. I don't even know if Seattle would have taken him, but even still, for a team that's right up against the cap, I don't see how Ryan McDonough at over six million a year is the type of guy that you should protect. They lost Yanni Gord for nothing. Yanni Gord is a really good player and they probably could have gotten something for him. I had always thought that the move for Tampa would have likely been protect seven forwards to keep the big three forwards that ended up being available protected and find some way to get Washington native Tyler Johnson onto the Seattle Kraken. Now they still ended up moving Johnson, so that ended up not too badly for them. But at the same time, uh, losing Gord for nothing just to keep a guy like McDonough, and again, maybe not even a guy they would have taken with Seattle, I, I really question that move uh, as a whole. I'm sure the other two guys in uh, Palat and Kalorn also weren't thrilled about being left off the protected list, but we'll see what happens. I'm sure they're both ha really happy about winning two Stanley Cups and the prospect of potentially winning a third. So. Maybe it's not that big of a deal, but even still, that was probably the big glaring error for me from them. And putting a bow on this list is the Toronto Maple Leafs. 
It's funny, I think the one move that I think is going to cost them the most is probably the move that at the time seemed like the smartest move for them to make. They acquired Jared McCann for a seventh round pick and a prospect that Pittsburgh already owned once and was traded to the Leafs. And who knows if he'll ever even play in the AHL, let alone the NHL. The Leafs acquired Jared McCann, a player that supposedly was quite coveted by the Seattle Kraken. This was thought by Toronto that they could expose him and it would protect other players on the roster from being taken. Well, it ended up going that way. McCann was taken, but what the Toronto Maple Leafs were left with was a player I think at least some had in mind that the Kraken would take in Alex Kerfoot. Alex Kerfoot is a decent hockey player. He's under contract for a few more seasons. He's about a $3 million cap hit, so nothing to really worry too much about. Unless you're the Toronto Maple Leafs and you have almost no cap space because of the contracts you have for your top players and your top three defensemen. So looking at that, I would have said maybe you should have just let Kerfoot go if that was the player Seattle was going to take. So they haven't been able to move him yet. I really thought he was going to get moved during the offseason because the Leafs currently are over the cap and they probably do need to move somebody. Hey, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And I want to hear from you in the comments. Where did I get it wrong? Where did I get it right? What do you think some of your favorite teams went wrong this summer? We'll see you next time on Thought Hockey.